Green Homes October Forum. Um, my name is Rebecca Fenton, and I'm a volunteer with Green Home NYC. Uh, Green Home NYC is an all-volunteer, nonprofit organization that promotes sustainability and energy efficiency in the built environment and supports green professional development. You can go to Green Home NYC to see our upcoming events and read our blog. Our three main programs for Green Home NYC are Green Careers. We host events the second Tuesday of every month. These are great for people interested in career or transitioning into a career in sustainability. Um, our monthly forum tonight is held the third Wednesday of every month. And this is our first one back in, in person since COVID. So thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, and we also have green building tours. This gives you the chance to see real world exams examples of sustainability in action. Everything at Green Home NYC is done by volunteers. No paid staff, no offices, and yet we have managed to run these events for 15 years. Our organization is a great example of what volunteer professionals can accomplish. Um, are there any volunteers in the audience tonight? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in volunteering, uh, speaking, writing, or contributing in future events, please talk to one of our volunteers. We'd be happy to get you involved. Um, we'd also like to thank our hosts here at Fujitsu, who have generously don donated this space to us tonight. And if you're watching on video after the event, we're on the 42nd floor of Fujitsu's beautiful air stage overlooking Times Square, and the sunset is pretty awesome, so we thank them again. Um, and Fujitsu is a manufacturer of energy efficient HVAC equipment. Um, so now to get started on our topic for tonight, we're really excited for this panel discussion with our experts on the topic of grassroots retrofits. Grassroots retrofits is the concept of neighbors helping neighbors find ways to create more sustainability in the residential built environment. There's several factors converging now and stacking up to grab the attention of New Yorkers to prioritize energy efficiency in their homes. The IRA incentives, Local Law 97, renewable technologies coming to scale, and rising energy costs. But how do everyday people juggling work and family find time to research and make good decisions, secure financing, no less handle all the communication to get an entire co-op board to agree? Our panel of experts are going to share how they're working with the community and partnering with other agencies to get these projects off the ground, as well as the concept of clustering and consolidating for group RFPs. <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce them. We have Anthony Ng and Michael Perella, volunteers with Queens Climate Project. Jose Galvez Contreras, solar researcher and program manager at Solar One. And John Ahrens, utilities program manager with Association for Energy Affordability. So tonight's format is going to be a group panel discussion followed by a Q&A that we all we want it to be interactive, so please think about your questions. Um, we're going to start with each speaker giving a brief overview of their work and then go deeper into their experience with grassroots efforts. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll do our Q&A. Um, so would you like to kick it off for Queen's Climate Project? Sure, so just a quick intro. Do you want to get into everything right now? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, great to be here this evening. And I didn't know that this is the first in-person event for Green Home and Marcy in over two years, so very honored to be here. So again, Anthony Ng, um, I'm one of the steering committee members of the Queens Climate Project. I'm joined by my fellow uh, steering committee member. Hi, I'm Michael Perell. Happy to be here. Steering committee member for Queens Climate so I'm going to start by just giving a little background about our group and talk about how we started our Green Building Task Force and then Michael will share some more specific examples. But Queens Climate Project, we've been around for about three and a half years since about May of 2019. And you know, we're just a bunch of neighbors and climate activists and folks who wanted to come together to, with the mission of helping Queens and the city become healthier and have a more carbon-free future. Uh, we 
are involved in advocacy, advocacy campaigns that push for climate-friendly policies and legislation at the state level. We have some community education events, and we have two task forces. We have a green building task force, um, and we have a compost task force. Right? So those are some initiatives to really like take some uh, direct action on, on things. Um, you know, or we think about ourselves as a small but mighty group. There's six of us who are steering committee members. Rebecca's also been, you know, very involved in our green buildings task force. We have an email list of about 500. And uh, in a short amount of time, we feel like we've done some good work. So on the green buildings task force, we started this about a, a year ago, like last summer. And the idea was just to, you know, bring people together who are interested in making green building upgrades, you know. Uh, be it they wanted to comply with the local law 97 or climate mobilization act, or you know, they just wanted to, you know, make their buildings more energy efficient and, and more green, right? And you know, to start off the task force, the idea was, you know, let's just come together and learn together because there's a lot out there. You know, we all had bits and pieces of information. We knew some things, but you know, there was also a lot to learn. So we thought, you know, let's do it together. Right? Why do it on your own? It's complicated enough, right? There's a lot to learn. There's a lot of um, you know, technical knowledge. And you know, even for folks like myself and Michael and others who may uh, live in co-ops and have served on boards, there's a lot of information to, to go through, right? So the, the task force started, we started meeting, and, and this idea quickly emerged around, you know, if we can create some scale and like have buildings come together and do it together, if buildings want to do similar measures together, that's a way of um, maybe write, writing down costs, right? Uh, attracting some expertise, some financing to do it. So, um, you know, so that idea is still a vision that we really believe in and would love to see happen. You know, uh, most of our members are in Jackson Heights and Queens, so we'd love to see that happen in Jackson Heights, but we'd love to see it happen all throughout the city, right? This idea of bundling buildings together to attract finance and expertise to, to make it happen. Um, so, you know, Michael will talk about, you know, a few, you know, small successes we've had now about this idea of how we're bringing people together, being a peer network, sharing information, keeping each other motivated about, you know, how to do things. So, so one, of our, one of our collaborators in Jackson Heights um, is a board president for a small co-op, 10, 12 units, I think. Um, and he, this, this co-op uh, has thir is part of uh, 13 other co-ops that are all the same style of building. They're all at the same time. All independent co-ops, all independent governance structures. And this one board president, a colleague of ours, uh, wrangled the other 13 co-op boards, which is no insignificant feat, so let's just acknowledge that, uh, to go in on an ASHRAE 2 study to uh, study all of their mechanical systems, electrical systems, and figure out how they can do upgrades together. And, and bundle those services, and they're working on that right now. It's kind of, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a small step, but like co-op working together, it's hard enough working in a co-op uh, by yourself, but let alone we'll working with multiples. He's actually taking that first step, which is really exciting, and I sort of just it's a bit of fun, though, some portion of that study. Um, I can share with you some work we, I've been doing, and I'm in our building. I'm also Jackson Heights, um, just a few slides. So um, I, I live in a 42 unit, six story brick building, uh, and Jay injected with a single pipe steam system, and yeah, built in 37. So we used to use heat excessively, and if you're living in New York, you may, you may uh, identify with this uh, scenario. We used to use a lot of heat. So in January, we'd have windows open because it was just insanely hot. In 2014, our management company suggested putting in an energy management, management system. And so we, I was a little skeptical, but we put it in. And so it was about 10 to 12 wireless sensors that went all around the, the, uh, the units. Only about a quarter of the units had sensors in them. They were they're wireless. They report back to a computer in the basement that, that triggers the boiler to turn on and off. Um, it wasn't set up very well. After about two years, I really, really, really weren't noticing any of the any significant savings or even changes to our level of comfort. It's still very warm. So this was not a career choice by me. I dug into the system to sort of learn how it works, working with the, the manufacturer and management. This, this system was made by US Energy. So there's lots of other ones as well. Um, we dug into the control systems and we realized that like. Our coldest years were like 54 degrees or 56 degrees. Our warmest years were 84 degrees, 85 degrees. So a 30 degree spread in the building was chaos. Um, we scaled that to settings, got control of it. Um, this is me texting, phone calling, everyone in the building saying, okay, we're dialing this back now, educating our, educating our shareholders, coupled with taking air conditioners, uh, closing windows, checking the top staff is having fallen down, that kind of stuff. So, 
ultimately, we have made, we've made a lot of changes. And you can see the graph here. Uh, 2012, 2013, we're spending about $40,000 on heat. The subsequent two years, 2014, 2015, we spent, uh, did you go to the next slide, Rebecca? Uh, management had installed the system. Uh, next one, one more slide, sorry. I mentioned the solar system, but then there was still a lot of uh, a lot of consumption there. But when we took control of it in 2016, there was a massive drop. We cut the heating, we cut our heating bill up, not quite in half, uh, and we really scaled it back. We kind of fell off the wagon a little bit through 2019, uh, and then in 2020, 2021, we actually one more slide, please, Rebecca. We we reduced our hot water temperature to 135 uh, and changed some settings in the boiler and actually kept it at that roughly 20,000 plus level, and it was a real benefit for all of us. So. Um, it was a fair bit of work, but it was one thing to recognize that we share with the only ones with the incentive to actually do this work. Uh, management isn't going to do this for us. Uh, they're not incentivized to do that, at least in our contract. We now have an A rating when those came out a year ago, two years ago, we, had, we, had, we, had, we have an A. Uh, and more importantly, we changed the culture of our building. Um, the system, the system, the system is imperfect. Uh, it will never be 100% perfect for everyone that we recognize that, but we did change the culture and everyone recognized now that they have a part to play in this, so thank you. Um, and John and Jose, I know that you're actually out in the field doing a lot of this work. Can you share with us, um, first, um, John, if you can start by just uh, giving everybody a little background on what ADA does, and then, um, and Jose as well, and some real examples of buildings that are consolidating efforts or having successful projects, and like, what is, what's the difference between a successful project versus the ones where there's a lot of roadblocks? Okay, so um, I won't go into everything that AEA does because we do a lot, um, but there are flyers in the back of the room that you can pick up. Um, but we are, we have, among other things, we're a training center, um, and we do a lot of, you know, demonstrations of the EMS systems that Michael referred to. We're actually currently, as we speak, getting Fujitsu uh, air exchangers installed in our building. Um, to upgrade our heating system. Um, we do solar, we have solar demonstration on our roof, we have a green roof. Um, but more, probably more significantly, we do, um, we have a large tech services department that provides um, energy audits for uh, buildings looking to meet local law 87 and local law 97 um, requirements. Um, we also have a local law 84 department where, you know, for uh, monitor, monitoring uh, people's um, energy use. Um, I think I said we have a training department. Um, we have a new construction department. We're also a weatherization agency. Um, and all of those things are going on around the building. We're, we're in a fairly large building. And then um, we have my department, which is utility programs. So utility programs, um, are run or paid for by um, by a, a, a service charge on everybody's electric and gas bill, and um, the services that AEA provides specifically are direct install uh, measures, um, which are free to the customers that we provide them to. And our target is uh, affordable um, affordable customers our affordable housing customers, um, and although we service everybody in the city. So like, um, in-unit direct install is our primary program. We go to tenants' apartments, we offer them free LED light bulbs in exchange for their incandescent bulbs and their CFLs. Uh, we also offer them low flow shower heads and low flow uh, sink and kitchen and bathroom sink aerators. Um, and all of these things help save energy. Um, the water measures save generally the building owner uh, money. Uh, so a lot of owners are happy to do those. Um, the light bulbs typically will save the tenant money. And since the tenant is also paying into this benefits charge, we want them to get it. So that's, you know, when we talk about some of the challenges we face, a lot of times the building owner who has to sign off on us being in the building, um, they're only interested in saving hot, you know, saving gas on their hot water heating bill. And some of them will even like not even want 
has to do the LEDs for their tenants. So one of the grassroots, you know, speaking to the grassroots movements is having a, a strong tenant association or a strong, um, even just like a strong individual in the building, like a, um, what do they call it, like building mayor? Champion. Or champion, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that can sort of lead the charge. And we can, because we can have anything from, you know, doing 5% of the apartments in a building where we have no management involvement and the tenants just aren't, you know, feeling interested to we've had one and my colleague Pedro Berry here led the charge on a project where they did 100% of the units, which is very uncommon, but um, it is possible if you have good, strong engagement with the management um, and the tenants are you know, well educated and informed in advance, um, then, we can, then we can get more penetration in apartments saving more tenants money. And that's really what the goal is. That's why we're the Association for Energy Affordability. We're trying to make energy affordable, um, particularly in low income, low to moderate income households. They have a high, they pay a higher percentage of their income on electric or, or energy, energy bills. And so we want to bring that down to make it more equitable and uh, you know, easier for people to get by not having to make that decision between, you know, turning on the heat or turning on the air conditioning and eating or some, you know, those kinds of decisions. We want to take that out of the equation and make sure everybody can live in a safe and comfortable home. So that's what? just a sampling of some of the things that we do and the challenges. Yeah, well, one thing that I remember from our prep call is that you said that free can be a real trigger for New yes. Yorkers. Yeah, so another one of our challenges is we have, you know, guys guys and gals going to, you know, people's apartments and knocking on doors saying, hey, we're here from Con Ed, we're going to give you free light bulbs and change out your hair, or give you a shower head. And people immediately think, oh, you're an ESCO company, you're coming here to change my electric service and charge me more money. So, or they're like, oh, so you're gonna bill me later on this, on your electric bill, um, or on my electric bill for the things that you're installing today. So the word free is, I think it's, a, maybe it's a New Yorker's thing, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's uh, cause I wouldn't open my door for people either. I mean, I'd be quite honest. Um, and, for some reason, it's, it's a bit of a trigger, and so one of our challenges is how do we get around that, and how do we convince people that we're not in ESCO, we're not there to you know, change their electric bill. In fact, we actually show up, we don't have to ask you for your electric bill, because we already have all that information. We already know your name, we already know your account number. All we want to do is just give you some free stuff. So, um, I don't think that's what we should say. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, it, it was really inspiring to me, you know, I live in a building that's not subject to local law of 97, but um, I do live in a community, Jackson Heights, with a lot of environmentally concerned people, and, um, but of course, you know, we're sharing the building with a, a broad range. And um, when you said that about the free, I thought, oh, that's kind of a challenge for me. How, how can I get through that? And it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those easy things. It's pretty low-hanging fruit, like, yeah. you know, to change your LEDs and, and get aer aerators and see the difference on your electric bill right away. And um, I, I realized, okay, I'm, I'm in this building of 15 units. There's 13 other units on my block, and we all share, uh, you know, a, a Google, uh, listserv. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just gonna say, hey guys, I want to organize this event. Anybody who wants to change their LED bulbs, it's gonna be free. And then hearing it from me, I'm a neighbor. You know, we were always helping each out, uh, each other out on, you know, get a cup of sugar, that type of thing. Right. And it can go a long way. And I think, and then also speaking to the grassroots retrofits sort of mindset you do that one low-hanging fruit, and then it, you find out, okay, who who in these buildings is really motivated on climate, and right. how can we help each other out, and what resources do we know? And so, um, 
And it turns out there's like a lot of people who work in the built environment. And even for those of us who do, do work in the built environment, there's so much to slog through. So, um, you know, I, I met a, a consultant recently um, who can help our buildings, you know, find, aggregate service providers like you for something that works best for my building type. So it's, it's just, it's, it's really great to have the, those conversations with you because that, just hearing that from you about the free, I'm like, oh yeah, I can totally see some of the people in my building just, it, it, it's, it's hard, you, it's, it's easy to misunderstand. Yeah, it's, and people will, they want to see like the terms and conditions and they want to see all these other things, the what is their liability, you know, it's, it's crazy what some people ask for. It's, Excuse me, a microphone's in the, in the vault. In the vault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 like are there mic are these Google bulbs, you know, yeah. are they going to like answer my calls or something, you know. <laughs> no, there's light bulbs. <laughs> they're very cheap light bulbs. Not cheap, but low, low cost light bulbs. Affordable. Affordable light bulbs. Thank you so much for that. Um, Jose, thank you. Awesome. Hi, everybody. My name is Jose Galvez Contreras, and I am a senior program manager with Solar One. And Solar One, I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction of the nonprofit. It's a nonprofit organization. We have uh, four main programs. The first program is that we started with a small park at Stadison Cove Park. The neat thing about this park is in the east side, it's small, very tiny. Um, it is designed to have native uh, plant species there, and that's how our nonprofit actually started. But when something really unique happened during Hurricane, uh, during Hurricane Sandy was when uh, everything in that area of Manhattan was uh, shut down because there was no electricity. Stuyvesant Cove Park had electricity because we had an off-the-grid um, home or like little shed, and people were using it to come and install uh, and charge their phones during that time of crisis. So that's a, a little side story of how the nonprofit started. The Solar One has been around since 2002, but that park uh, is emblematic because of that reason. But our main programs are three main programs. The first one is the Green Design Lab, and we educate and work with teachers and students at the same time, bringing our green, uh, green curriculum to the classrooms to help people become more aware about green education, green jobs, you know, the transition from fossil fuel to renewable energy economy and inspire children majority, in its majority to, to have access to these types of opportunities. The second one uh, program that we do work is uh, the Green Workforce Development, where we work with for, mainly formerly incarcerated folks, people, uh, communities of color, marginalized communities, and we give uh, people access to green jobs and training through carpentry, electricity, uh, solar energy uh, installation uh, projects, and then we do a uh, job placement uh, work. And then the third uh, program that that's where I belong, that's where I work, is called the Here Comes Solar program. And Here Comes Solar, we do technical assistance to buildings throughout New York City, all kinds of building, but specifically we work with affordable housing in providing technical assistance to understand how, what is the solar potential on those roofs and how can they have solar energy on top of their roofs. Our services are completely free of cost. Basically, what we do is that we would get someone's electricity bill, 12 months worth of electricity bills for the common area, low hanging fruits. Um, and then the address, we do a remote site assessment by looking at the buildings through uh, Google Maps, another software that we just wanna make sure that there's clearance on those roofs. And then we design the solar systems and then we create a cost savings estimate up to 25 years which we then share with the building owners, managers, property uh, managers, uh, uh, co-op boards, et cetera. And then we help them understand what is the cost benefit uh, in terms of going solar. How much are they gonna save? We uh, provide all of the consultation from front end to the end about uh, what are the incentives available to buildings and how they can take advantage of those incentives from uh, the state tax, uh, the state, the state uh, rebate program, which helps pay for the solar system, all the way through the federal tax credits, the state tax credits, uh, the city property tax abatement, and if they're like private owners, we give them the rundown of what are the accelerated depreciation for the systems as well. So we really give a holistic view, and if the buildings do decide to go solar uh, through our program, we carry them through the process by releasing a request for proposal on their behalf, 
where we go out and seek, uh, seek bids on their behalf uh, from different installers that we have worked with over the years. So we have in our list about 17 qualified installers that they come through our program and then we release our bids to those uh, installers. They choose whether to not bid on that project. Usually we call a successful RFP when we receive anywhere between three to five bids which also makes the cost of solar to come down because installers are bidding on projects, they want to get the projects, so they're being, it becomes a competitive procurement and that helps us to provide options to buildings to have a much more affordable solar on top of their roofs. And we help them go through the interview process to navigate what it would look like to look contracting with those installers all the way through the installation completion. So once the installation is completed, then they, we serve as a balance, uh, like a, like a sounding board for them to come back and ask us questions that they may have afterwards or during the, the process of going solar. So that's what Here Comes Solar, the program of Solar One does. We have helped over 750 buildings throughout New York City to actually go solar. That's about uh, 15, uh, anywhere between 15 to 20 megawatts of solar we have been responsible in, in supporting through our program. And that's really neat because we're doing the, we are helping buildings, you know, like uh, in a way that they would not have understood before because we basically are in the middle between the engineers, the installers, and uh, in the grassroots level where we really help people to really uh, bring this like complicated terms into like really like uh, regular conversations that we would have. So I have a lot of conversations every day with all kinds of people uh, throughout the city. And yesterday we were just doing a solar tour at one of our buildings. So if you guys are interested, we could partner and do something that we could see an installation and then see what they look like on top of buildings roof once they have been completed. In terms of uh, bundling uh, projects, uh, Solar One uh, recently, or uh, back in, um, in the 2018, 2000, yeah, 2018, led a, uh, this is an example, a campaign uh, called Co-ops Go Solar. Uh, it started called uh, Solar Uptown Now, which was all the way in Harlem, where co-ops in Harlem with partnership of different nonprofit organizations such as We Act for Environmental Justice, a really, uh, really great organization here in the city, as well as um, uh, You Have, uh, which helps a lot of HDFCs throughout the city uh, to give them energy efficiency uh, information and like how to make uh, this uh, HDFCs to become much more green. Uh, they partnered together with Solar One in providing technical assistance and organizing this uh, local HDF HDFCs is Housing Development Corporation funds, which are which are like uh, are buildings of the city for uh, for low to moderate income people. They're affordable housing and they provide a pathway to ownership to low to moderate income people throughout the city. Just a quick side note: seventy percent of the city's rentals, thirty percent is ownership, so it's important that we address the housing crisis at a later day, but, or today, of course, but like at a later day we can have this conversation. But HDFCs really provide the opportunity for people to actually have ownership on their homes. So uh, Solar One with You Have and We Act came together, they organized all of this uh, co-op uptown, and all together decided to go solar at the same time. So what happened was that Solar One led the RFP or the request for proposal process, and we were able to seek uh, different bids from different installers, which when you do an aggregate uh, type of uh, RFP or a request for proposals, you are adding the kilowatts of solar on top of those roofs to become much more larger. So you want installers will naturally want to bid on that project. So it was so successful that we were able not only to bring the price down, but also that all of these co-ops now had like really neat installations on top of their roof at a price that was much more affordable than what they would have got, gotten if they would have gone themselves to the market. So what would it cost them, let's say, there's different types of installation, but what I will just say, what would it cost them, let's say, uh, $3.50 per watt, that's how you calculate the total cost of a solar energy system, came down to $2.70 per watt. So that was really reduced their, their pricing. All of these co-ops now are you know, benefiting from solar energy technology. At that time, it was about 12 uh, co-ops that went solar at the same time. So far, we have done over 40 that have gone through that same campaign, that have gone solar uh, through that same program. And that's just an example of what bundling or like aggregating together different buildings, coming together in unifying efforts to help you bring the cost uh, to make your buildings energy efficient. And I do want to put a side note 
on why solar is much more important right now because we've been speaking about this local law 97. So I don't know if you, everyone is familiar about what local law 97 is, but I just want to like uh, make a, like a survey. Do, does it, do everybody know what local law 97 is? Okay, one or two, but I will explain. So for, for those of us that are not like really well aware of what local law 97 is, there is, uh, in 2019, the city created this, uh, this policy called the Climate Mobilization Act. It's a set of five policies come together, which is, are requiring buildings to actually bring uh, their carbon emissions down. Because 70% of the carbon emissions of New York City do not come from transportation, do not come from us like emitting carbon dioxide, you know, through our own breath, but it's much more because of the buildings. 70% of our carbon emissions actually come because of the buildings. Gas, uh, oil, heating, all of this is because of the buildings because we live in such a dense environment that the city said, how can we make our building much more greener? oh, the way that we can do this is by making our, our buildings energy efficient. And that's why groups like John's are so important because there are low hanging fruits like light bulbs that you can start changing and it helps your building to become much more ener energy efficient. Or groups like the Queens Climate Project, neighbors uh, talking to neighbors because they can share on how they can work together to make their buildings much more energy efficient. So the Climate Mobilization Act is requiring all of this set of new rules and some of them includes like having solar energy technology on top of your roof if you are gonna do a new construction or you're gonna do a major renovation on top of your roof or you either require solar energy or green roofs as well as which is really cool right new york city actually side note too is the only city in the world who has a who is like really driving this plan no other city is doing the same as, as we are so this is a really perfect case study for all communities, because if New York can do it, I think that the rest of the world can drive a clean energy future. But it's gonna take time, and it's gonna take all of us to, to come together and do this work. So the idea is that by 2050, the whole city is gonna be depending on completely green, renewable energy technology. Who owns the energy? That's another conversation we can have <laughs> at another day too. But, uh, so local Law 97 falls under this Climate Mobilization Act policies, that is one of them. But Local Law 97 is saying, if your building is not green by a certain time, 2024, which is next year, we're gonna start putting a carbon tax if your building is 5,000 square foot or, or, or bigger. And that means that per ton of carbon emissions, you're gonna be taxed a certain amount of money. So now buildings are strapped that they have to like, not only have to continue to, to pay for their regular repairs, but if they're not green enough, they also have to pay a tax. So that's why programs like the people who are here in this panel, but also like the New York City Accelerator or your program, you know, are, are, are emerging, the green, uh, the green hubs, uh, the, green, the, clean energy hubs. The, the clean energy hubs are emerging because they are helping and supporting to drive these buildings to become much more green. So Local 197 is, is specifically about that carbon tax. So it's setting a tax on the carbon that each of the buildings are emitting. So now that's why Solar One and the Clean Energy Hubs, the New York City Accelerator, uh, John's program, AEA, yes. And then the uh, Queens Climate Pro Projects are like really important in, in helping us uh, be able to become much more greener, but also that buildings do not get taxed, and also for the city to achieve its goal to becoming completely uh, green by the year 2050, 100% like electrified. So uh, that's a little bit about Solar One. That's a little bit of a, an example of why aggregate uh, uh, communities and like uh, bundling projects help bring down the cost, and an idea of what we can do together and why. So much, Jose, and thanks for the overview of the law 97. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we're ready to wrap up and open up our Q&A. Um, are there any questions? Hi, my name is Austin, and I work at Block Power. Hey. Oh. Nice. Um, one of the things that I, so I'm part of the business development team, so my job is to sell e-pumps. <laughs> One of the biggest struggles that we see is cost, especially with a lot of the HVACs that I've been working with. They want to do it, totally in for it, but then when the cost comes in, just to buy the equipment, it's already a big push. And then when transitioning, the electricity cost. So then the day, it's, the economics don't 100% make sense for these, for, for a bunch of clients. So I'm just curious how to each of you go about having those conversations where people say, I love it, but the money's not there. 
I know AEA is very actively involved in the same thing, um, and we're kind of struggling with those same challenges because here in the city, the building owners for for rental in multifamily buildings, the building owner is the one responsible for heat. If you install one of these uh, heat pumps in, you know, in, in their window or whatever in their AC sleeve and you plug it into their wall, then it's, it's their electricity, it's not the building. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge because you have to address either finding a way to bring electricity up to all the units to you know provide it from a, a central plant in the basement or maybe from solar um, to making a reduction in the tenant's bill that, that the amount that is you know allotted for um, for, for for heating so it's it's kind of it's you know, it's one of those issues, and it is, it's a complication. It's actually one of several complications, as we were as we were talking before, because we're surrounded by all these these plants in this room. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly a, a difficult um, equation. I think building owners are sort of making doing the math, and they're saying, you know, you know, they have to. You know, on the one hand, they they're they're risking paying thousands of dollars in carbon taxes if they don't meet certain goals. And there's a 2024 goal, which probably most of the buildings will meet. Mm -hmm. There's a 2030 goal that most of the buildings will not meet. And that's probably the bit, the harder crunch. Um, and, um, and they wanna, you know, they don't wanna pay thousands of extra dollars in carbon taxes. So that's gonna be part of the math equation. Is it cheaper for me to run lines, which is very expensive, obviously, to run lines to every apartment, you know, so that you're paying for this yourself, or am I better off taking that reduction in my rent, the rental income, which, if you have a lot of energy efficient cost, uh, tenants, maybe you, maybe you're going to end up spending more money on that, and maybe, you know, that's taking less off, or taking off more money than you would actually end up spending on. Um, are saving you know, on this plant, so it's it's there's a lot of balance, and then there's I mean there's other things even beyond that. Like we were talking about, you know, some of these things have condensation because basically these heat pumps are sort of like air conditioner units turned around. Mm -hmm. So a typical AC unit blows cold air inside the apartment and hot air outside the apartment, and if you flip it around, you'll blow hot air inside the apartment and cold air outside. The so that's kind of how it works. That's a very high level <laughs> understanding. I'm not an engineer in any way. Um, so, but as you know, air conditioning units, they leak water. So what do you do with that water? You can't just, during the winter time, you can't just let it spill outside on the sidewalk because it will create a slippery situation. You obviously can't let it leak inside the apartment either. So you also have to deal with, you know, how do you address the water that comes off of these units? So there's a number of issues, particularly in, in you know large multifamily buildings that, that need to be addressed, and but cost is certainly paramount because you know money, even free things apparently cost cost a lot of money. So yeah, it's part of the issue that I've also had is when talking to big buildings, or just buildings in general that have to deal with local law 97. Folks will say, "What's well, much cheaper for me to pay the fine yeah. than actually make the upgrade?" And then when it really comes down to actually having to pay a fine that, you know, break even point, then that's not until 10 years from now. So then they're committing, right, to fossil fuel for another 10 years. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to show, I'm just curious. No, I think one of, the, one of the challenges is that, you know, these upgrades are, these are, these are like multi-year plans to develop. It's going to take time. So if you start, if you start it when those fines start hitting in 2034, you're paying those fines for a few years. If you start it now, well, you've got, 12 years to jump on this you know, or whatever that's 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 a, that's a head start also too, jose your firm turned me on to some of the tax credits that are available like the historic preservation tax credit you guys outlay all those tax credits in your pool so it's, it makes it you can speak to that it makes it really it really makes it a no-brainer no for for for, for owner occupied i think uh for your in your case right because your question is like how do you work with especially with hdfcs and like once they see the the cost they get a little bit deterred by it 
uh, for solar is exactly the same. You know, when even though that the incentives for solar are so good because there is like the federal, the state, the city property tax payment, in, in some cases the historic tax credit was the New York Sun incentive, all of these incentives. Um, you know, there, there's still some cash up front. And many of the buildings do have other priorities that may involve like uh, window repairs or maybe like the boilers or whatever, whatever that looks like they have to take care of these other issues first, that it becomes much more difficult for them to think like, we need a solar energy system, or if they need a solar energy system, they may say that like, we actually need a new roof before we can put that solar energy system. So that, that becomes like a, a, a game of priority. What is our priority right now? But I think that you know a way to, because Block Power is a great organization, I think we've worked before through Solar One together on some projects. But I, I think that the way to, to go about it is like partnership first with you know, city programs like the New York City Accelerator is a, is a good way to add in yourself, uh, your organization in the, in the hat of like service providers because there is so much more than just, um, than just like HDFCs, like the, the building typologies of New York City is like much more larger. New construction will also require heat pumps because the buildings will need to be electrified. So that's another way to like start getting, you know, the word out there. Um, I think that another way is like when you start building these types of partnerships, advocating for much more uh, uh, incent like like better incentives to, to make the, the, the work uh, happen at the city, but also at the state level. So like partnership and like unionizing, you know, some of the efforts I think will, will lead you somewhere uh, at a, at that will have an, your project will have an impact at a larger scale. And in our case, we provide what we call the solar savings estimate, which we really show like the net benefits after a certain period of time. Like I, I really try to tell my customers, like if this solar system doesn't pay by year 13, 14, like I, I read you, I'd rather you sign up for community solar, you know, because even though that they can still see some benefits, like they could do something else with, you know, better priorities that they can address rather than, uh, than not. Because I really, my goal is to really help the building to understand uh, why solar is good after their incentives, but also if solar is not good, I don't want to like push something that is not going to help them. But I think heat pumps, uh, are part of the equation. I, you know, I wouldn't feel discouraged. I think that um, cash is always a problem with affordable housing, and that's why we need that we need to. I don't want to sound a little bit Marxist here, but we need to like like revamp our, our our type of system here. You know, like we need to make it much more affordable for everybody, and I think that that's where we're struggling to. Yeah, and, and there are um, there are a number of financial. Um, services available for energy upgrades. Um, I know NYSEEC has one, I think there's a few others that um, help you fund those projects mm -hmm. at like a, I think it's like three and a half percent interest. And sometimes- yeah, pace is coming out too through the city. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's another, that's another way to like, you know, to, to look at it. And I suspect that just as with solar, the more buildings we install heat pumps mm -hmm. in, the lower the cost will become. So it, right now, it's kind of a new technology. It's like the brand new iPhone. You know, it's it's expensive. So a few years from now, it'll be upgraded and still cost the same. No. Uh, so a few years from now, it'll be cheaper, and you know the you know and the market will start to take over on that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think this just reinforces this theme of like bundling, right? Mm -hmm. I mean. Some of the conversations we've had to the Green Buildings Task Force is like, okay, when we brought the group together, people were excited about it, but then they said, well, how do you decide you know, who goes into the bundle? You know, every building's different. And then some buildings may want to do solar first, or they want to you know, um, look at heat pumps, or want to do some other you know, energy efficiency measures. Right? So like, then there, we got to this, these discussions about the sequencing of it all. Right? So, but you know, again, by being in touch with each other, by working you know, as a network, and there's, you know, our group hasn't met in a while, so I'm excited for the, the next meeting we want to call of, of our task force and, and, and to hear an update from people like, hey, how's it going? What have you been doing, right? So that by being in communication with the, each other, we can work towards the day when we could bundle some projects, right? And again, attract the, the expertise, the, the financing about it. And, you know, definitely, I mean, our group has connected to Accelerator too, and they've been a helpful resource, you know. 
actually the, the example that Michael shared before about um, these co-ops in our neighborhood where they're going together on this ASHRAE level two audit, well, they accelerate help to put out a bid to find the, the consultants yeah. to do that, right? And then, and then they got NYSERDA, NYSERDA is paying for three quarters of that, right? So, you know, there are entities like them, like AEA, like, like Solo One, like these are resources for buildings that, you know, buildings need to and should connect to. Now, granted, there's not enough, right? But I'm sure your groups will want more resources to do this work and even accelerate. And, you know, again, that's a larger question, right, about how do we do this? And I think there are people thinking about other more system approaches, right? You know, uh, about just how to do all this, because we all know that we want to decarbonize in a really quick amount of time to really prevent additional warming. And there's all these, like, targets we want to hit, like through the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act and all that. but it's then how do you implement all this, right? So, um, yeah, I, I I agree. You know, like you know, heat pumps. That's a newer technology now, but it could benefit from bundling too, right? You know, is block power specifically working with affordable housing, or you focus on all kinds of buildings? In this all kinds of buildings, but our focus. Well, part of our mission is to actually work with low-income communities and disadvantaged communities. So we are trying. There's another member of our task force who's done a lot of work in Sunset Park, you know, um, and you know he told us about a story of just it, it takes time. There's there's no shortage around it, unfortunately. There there isn't, right? Because um, you have to have those conversations, you have to have those relationships. You know, not everyone has the same level of understanding about financing, the economics. People, you know, some people are like I don't want to pay another cent, yeah. right? It's it's our it's it's what it is, you know. It's, it's people. <laughs> Right, and, and but the only way you can get around that is is um, you got to have that engagement, right? Right, because otherwise, you know, it's not going to happen, right? And, and you, you can't enable in action by not trying, right? By not wanting to, you know, have the conversation, have the relationships to try to move it, move it forward. So um, there's also the HDFC coalition, and then there's the you have. Uh, which I think are good uh, places to connect to because they would definitely, um, they're always like looking for service providers that can help HDFCs go solar and they have real communication with boards at an ongoing basis. Uh, every board is different, you know, every different, every board has different kinds of characters and I mean, I, I'm in an <laughs> HDFC too and like there's all kinds of characters in my own board. Uh, but we just have to like, you know, keep trying and, and not give up on each of the buildings because eventually you can delay doing these projects up to a certain time but eventually the taxes will be much more higher than not doing the projects and it will affect property values ultimately yeah. they can't escape it so. yeah. 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 Uh, i don't know if this is <coughs> available in new york but in new jersey i did a system with momentum solar a solar company mm -hmm. where there was there's no upfront costs it's a, it, they own the system, and uh, well, you're familiar with this kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they own the system, they manage it, uh, or they maintain it, they installed it, and it's set up on a, a two-way meter. Uh, so uh, the the power is charged back to me. Whatever I produce, you know, I pay for, but at a wholesale rate. So this is a, I don't know if this is available yeah. here, that you know, there's no upfront costs and the power is cheaper. Yeah. It, it was, could be an option for you know, all these questions about how to finance the system. Yeah. So that's called a power purchase agreement uh, or PPA. Uh, and what, what you do is that you will have a solar investor who will come into an agreement with your building and say, we will install the system on top of your roof. We own the system. Uh, the agreement, basically the agreement is that you will buy the electricity from us at a discounted rate 
that you would pay to the grid. So let's say Con Edison is charging you 23 cents per, cents per kilowatt hour that you are being, uh, that you're being consuming. Instead, that solar energy system owner will charge you now 20 cents per kilowatt hour. So you're getting like, a, like anywhere between 10 to 15% discount from what you would have paid to the grid from that arrangement uh, with the power purchase agreement. And then the, the neat thing about New York too is that the incentives are split in two. So the building will claim the property tax abatement for having installed that solar and the building will also claim the state uh, taxes for the shareholders while the investor claims the federal tax credit, which is the 30%, as well as the depreciation on the system, uh, and they will sell the electricity at a discounted rate, so they capture that amount of money. And the building also can claim, now with local law 97, for having installed solar by the tons of carbon emissions that you are taking out of the atmosphere, uh, like the credit that you would have been taxed for that solar energy system, the building can claim that and then that could minus their discounted rate, their discount on their tax. So that's uh, it, that's available here? It is available, yeah. In our state? Yes, yeah. it is. And if you're interested, we can help you. If you connect with me after, you, I can put you in touch with, if you're building, I can, in this scenario that you're building wants to have a power purchase agreement, we, have, we work with many people who are. I don't know of any downside of this approach. The, the do. downside is that definitely you don't own the solar energy system, uh, that you are not, you know, like, so this is how it works. The best scenario, if you were, the best scenario to take advantage of solar energy at its maximum is if you put the cash up front. If you have the cash up front, you're gonna see the returns come up much more faster to your building. But that, if that's not the case because you don't have the money, because many buildings are struggling with other priorities, then the next level would be going towards um, doing the, a, 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 a solar purchase as well through a loan, right? So now you're paying interest to like a lender uh, at a 5% interest rate or 5 to 7% per percent depending on who is your provider, your loan provider. Uh, there are programs like the PACE program that the city is like launching uh, and hopefully it's at a low interest rate. And then the third one would be do, go, doing it through a power purchase agreement. And then finally, if, uh, if your roof is not fit for solar or you don't have the money to, you don't want to enter like an agreement through a third party provider or owner of the system, I would say go with uh, community solar. So those are like those are the steps that I personally think as the, as the best options first cash purchase, second cash purchase through a loan, third uh, power purchase agreement, and fourth uh, community solar. However, community solar is good for everybody. So like I am subscribed to community solar myself for my own account, and I see ten percent discount on my electricity every month. So it's pretty cool. Like if you pay your own electricity bill in your unit. I still encourage everybody to sign up to Community Solar. Yeah, I have a question for the people. Have called the I'm sorry, I'm not from the US, so I don't know maybe that you call them, but uh, for the engineering of these really bad quality uh, wooden structure buildings, I live in, in this, for example, and I live between Prospect Park and Coney Island, mm -hmm. and uh, it's terrible for this reason. Like, the whole structure is so bad. The Is your building, uh, what, do you know the size of your building? Like, I don't know, how many units does your building? Six units, okay. Yeah, so, I, yeah, sorry, so the, uh, the owner is a really old lady. <laughs> <laughs> she never picks up, so how can you do So that, that's, a, that's a tough one, right, because the owner has to be, involved and they would want to have to get involved in like retrofitting their building so 
Uh, my friend here uh, is doing the Clean Energy Hubs, so he's providing those types of services, and I think it's it's a good opportunity for the two of you to connect, and maybe you can bring his business card directly to the lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's one way. The other way is that you can contact the New York City Accelerator, and because any any building that is like five units or more, the New York City Accelerator will provide you those services. But again, uh, <laughs> the the top situation here is that the owner of the building has to really be very wanting to get involved. Another op option that I can offer you and strategize is that you can start knocking on your neighbor's doors and then like have conversations with them. And then once you have like a much more consolidated effort, like this is what we're speaking about, like neighbors talking to neighbors, there is a much more of a pressure for this owner to really want to like do something because now their tenants are not comfortable. So I think that's like one way to, to think about it. And in terms of like uh, structure, like buildings in New York City, some are like from the 1900s, and like they, like there's a lot of upgrades. So that may deter your your landlord to not want to do anything to because it will require a lot of money yeah. for them to do it. So.